Well, um, this panel uh, will deal with a massive increase in computer power together with the emergence of artificial intelligence and similarly advanced learning applications put promise to put technology at the forefront of medical progress in the next decade. And the ability to harness big data, bioengineering and physics to create virtual and biological simulations of the human body is one of the most consequential innovations with potential to improve drug development and delivery and secure better patient outcomes, safety and at lower cost. And uh, <clears throat> we have an outstanding panel here and uh, Amy Butler who is um, president of biosciences at Thermo Fisher Scientific. We have Steve Rosenberg, senior vice president and George, uh, general manager of Oracle Health Sciences. And uh, we have Eric Topol, and uh, he is um, chair of innovative medicine and director and founder of Scripps Research Translational Institute. And um, he is also the author of a book uh, entitled Deep Medicine. And last but not least, we have uh, Magnus Settegren. He is a, a professor in interventional cardiology at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. We'll continue with um, Steve Rosenberg, please. Rosenberg. Hi, I have no slides. <laughs> but I've been told I'm pretty entertaining without slides. <laughs> Maybe not. So um, when I look at the people on this panel, you know, who here has seen Sesame Street? <laughs> One of these things is not like the other? Okay, that would be me. I'm a neurophysician or a researcher, but I am a software guy, and I've been doing software for 40 years. And I've been doing clinical software for now about 15 years. And I get to work with companies like yours to figure out, you know, software takes time to develop. So to figure out what you're going to need in the future, it's the old, you know, skate where the puck's going as opposed to skate where the puck is. And if you look at what's going on in clinical research, and what we do at Oracle, other than brand this place a little bit, is we do software to help clinical research and also, to some extent, healthcare. But in the clinical research side, it's changing so rapidly right now, some of the stuff that Eric talked about, but also all the buzzwords that are out there, that may be on the floor in a minute, about um, what's changing. So everybody here is uh, virtual sites, patient centricity, uh, digital health. Um, then you have real world evidence, which I think is one of my favorite acronyms because all that means is data. You know, but <laughs> what can you do? And then you have science like CRISPR, and you have you know, organoids, which um, Amy's going to talk about, so I'm not going to go too far on that. And then you have all these crazy buzzwords and of tech buzzwords, AI, machine learning, deep learning, big data, blockchain. I don't like blockchain, but that's besides the point. <laughs> and cloud computing. So all these things are happening. But if you look at the business problems of clinical research and you look at what's going on, the software today, and I'm responsible for a big chunk of that, is not sufficient for the research of tomorrow. It needs to change. And I look at... Um, I look at, it's getting my picture taken. I thought I'd strike a pose. <laughs> Told you, I didn't need slides. Um, you know, I look at some of the stuff that's going on out there, and you know, Eric talked about some of the stuff in healthcare, but you look at some of the trials that are going on, there's a lot of device trials. There's a lot of patients being asked to wear devices, and, and some of them are very powerful, and they're, they're doing these devices. There's trials going on with hybrid sites. Um, Vertex has trials going on where they have a nurse come to someone's house with a centrifuge and set up camp for a day. And you know, there's all these things that are happening, but they're hard. 
The software that they can do this with requires multiple vendors, stitching things together, bringing the data sets in, trying to understand the fit for purpose, trying to figure out, you know, do the investigators get what data? Do the sponsors get what data? Do the patients get what data? It's a very complicated world, and the software is discombobulated. It's spread out over hundreds of vendors. So what's really needed now is um, a different class of software. So I don't want to make this an Oracle commercial, but what we do and what the software business is doing is trying to figure out what that is and what's necessary. So you, if you look at, um, you know, uh, anybody here from Roche? You guys made a huge investment in Flatiron to get some real great uh, cancer data to be used at. If you look at um, Sanofi, got a drug approved just by looking at the data in EHRs for Tegeo, approved for type 1 diabetes. There's a lot of work going on, but the software is not sufficient to enable this easily. So you need a new class of data, that, a new class of software that seamlessly integrates all this stuff in terms of being able to operate a clinical trial, to be able to um, set up a clinical trial for the way you need to collect the data, the way you can collect the data, the way you can analyze the data, and the way you deliver the data to both the patients, the investigators, and then to the FDA ultimately. And that's going to be a, a very different um, class of software. You also need to look at this data. The, the types of data that's being collected now is crazy. There's a genomic data. Everybody talks about that. I liked hell of a bites. I thought that was a really good thing. What do you like? I like the word ginormous, personally. <laughs> But um, the amount of data is insane, and there's new kind of data being collected now. When you look at some of the stuff that's coming out of the uh, regenerative medicine world, there's new types of data that's being collected, the CRISPR data being collected. There's no human in the world that can look at this data and make heads or tails out of it without machines help. But machines don't know anything. They have to be trained. They have to understand, you know, hypothesis. They have to understand things to do that. So the technology to analyze this data and train this data and be able to make it seamless to be used is a very important part going forward. And you know, and all this stuff needs to be done in a cloud environment so it could be shared amongst people. So that kind of, of systems are going to need to be built to make, to make this, this happen. And then data analysis, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a math guy and statistics are fascinating to me. And you know, you could coerce statistics to say anything almost, you know, um, you know, it's really, it's, so you got to make sure that data analysis is true <clears throat> and the data that you've collected is fit for purpose and the data you've collected is, can be, the lineage of that data can be traced back to where it came from and to understand that it's valid for what you're trying to do with it. And that's a very important part of this. As you start collecting crazy amounts of data and if you rely on EHR data, you don't know the conditions it was collected on or device data, you don't know if they strapped it to their dog and had it run around the house. I mean, so understanding the data and what it's fit for purpose is going to be a big part of these systems. So just to close, and I really have nothing prepared to close, but I'm out of time. Um, I, th <laughs> I think what you're going to see over the next generation of software um, coming relatively soon as we try to keep up is, is different systems that make people able to do their jobs easier and not have to you know, shape and mold and, and hire a million computer scientists on your own to do it, that the software will enable you to, to take all this new science, take all these new operational to tools, and put them in a seamless way to be able to uh, put all this together. I think someone else is next. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dennis Gilhooley. I run the Global Digital Health Initiative. Um, we're seeing converging ecosystems, which was brought up this morning, but the pharma, the life science, the ICT or information communications technology community are still highly siloed, speak very different languages, run on different market incentives. When would you see transformative game change, like, for example, Microsoft buying or acquiring Novartis, Apple? buying or acquiring Johnson & Johnson, Oracle buying or acquiring, well, you can answer that one. But um, there, has to be, really. <laughs> there has to be a major change before um, the ecosystem evolves such that we can actually have real data governance on a national and global scale. So, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree, but there's other industries. Microsoft never bought a bank, you know, and the banking software 
is doing okay out there. I, I think it's, you know, ATMs, remember when ATMs started, you know, and then they've grown up. And I, I think that the job of a software company is, is not to buy a drug company so we could integrate it. It's to compete with other software companies and innovate to enable this to happen. The other thing about this is crazy industry is it's all going to happen. We're still going to do clinical trials with forms and paper and record that data and just the way we've been doing it forever. We're going to do device trials. We're going to do real-world evidence trials. We're going to you know, have crazy genomics and personalized medicine. It's all going to happen. And the job of us software companies is to make sure that you have the tools and technologies that you don't have to think about it. You just go and make people's lives better. You know, and that's the key. It's not building giant conglomerates. No, but I mean, it's to actually learn from one to the other. Right. For example, Amazon taking over Whole Foods is one example. Right. I mean, do you have the knowledge to write the software? Is it Yes, so, th yes, we, the software companies, our job is to have the knowledge to do this. We work with our customers, we hire people that have this knowledge, we have advisory groups, we stay current. I mean, that's just the software business, and it's been going on forever in several industries. And we've done a reasonable job on clinical research, but the rate of change right now is like I've never seen another industry. Science is leading the way, and to catch up is going to be interesting. What we do know is, is what Eric talked about, volumes of data, deep learning, AI technology, but all that means that you have to deliver that stuff to the point of contact in healthcare and deliver that stuff into the clinical research at the right time. And that becomes the challenge. Dr. S Dr. Sam Samuelson, could I ask a question? I'm over here on, the, on your left. Um, you know, there's this tsunami of, of development of uh, uh, data driven uh, uh, methods to penetrate healthcare and uh, device or smartphone or mobile technology for data acquisition or delivery of, of service. Can you, um, yeah. How is this interfacing with the regulatory and the financing structure? I mean, are these to be healthcare uh, augmenters that are sort of uh, below the level of FDA approval, or are they going to be needed to sort of pass that standard and be eligible for reimbursement? And then how does, how does uh, healthcare financing relate to this disruptive uh, process in healthcare? So those are great questions, and I have opinions about them, but not necessarily influence on those things, right? So um, it's not the software, software world to make sure that the data that you go to FDA with can be proven as valid data. That's up to you to, to know that, how that data was collected and be able to convince FDA or show FDA that it's valid for what you're trying to prove. And whether it came from a device or an EHR or a form, that's up to you to understand how you collected the data. And some of that fear of going to FDA with that data is some of the thing that's holding back the innovation and in trying to do this stuff differently. There's no doubt about it. But there is case after case of people that have gone to FDA, have talked to them early, and, and succeeded with that. In terms of paying for it, so that's one of my favorite topics that I get to talk about that I have nothing to do with, like who's going to pay for all this great innovation? <laughs> You know, and different health systems have different ways of doing that. And to me, it's, um, I think this morning someone talked about a blood test that can predict cancer that can't get paid for. So, you know, that's a real problem in, in society. And, you know, being a Northeast liberal, I have opinions. <laughs> but um, not Bernie Sanders. But, but um, you know, we have to figure that out. We have to figure out how to, you know, pay for that. No one seems to mind. And we were talking about this at dinner last night. No one seems to, my, my son had open heart surgery. He's great. It's no big deal. But the operating room cost, the build cost of just the operating room was $165,000. No one batted an eyelash. No one said, oh, it's evil hospitals charging $165,000. You got a $20 copay and a drug. You guys are evil. So someone has to figure this stuff out, right? But it's not me. I just get to vote. <laughs> All right. No. Okay. I'm going to stand up also. And I do have a couple of slides, but I promise you just a couple. I'm just going to speak for about the next five minutes. Uh, what I think is amazing about the current era is not so much that technology is influencing medicine, which it has for centuries. You know, if you think back, way back to the 1800s, you know, the thermometer and the stethoscope changed how physicians treated patients. But what is amazing right now is the speed with which technology is evolving and the dramatic impact it's having on healthcare today. 
And so I'm just going to talk briefly about three areas, and I'm going to go really light touch on AI, because I think Eric did a great job, much better than I could have done, on elucidating the power of AI. But I, I will spend a little bit of extra time on the first example, because that's one we haven't talked about yet today, and I don't think will come up as much as uh, genetic engineering will in the afternoon session. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about 3D and personalized models. So three-dimensional models have been around for decades, especially depending on how you define that. But what really started to happen around the 1980s was the creation of these three-dimensional models, things like spheroids, leveraging hepatocytes, that really started to bring three-dimensional models into their own. And then you have this, this other vein of, of technology innovation uh, driven by Yamanaka, who I'm sure many of you uh, know, uh, who came up with this amazing way to take somatic cells from human adults and turn them into pluripotent stem cells. And it, it's these two different veins of, of technologies that really came together more recently to create something called organoid models. And you, you may have heard those. Um, I'm a neuroscientist by training, so in particular, I was struck by the recent publication of these sort of mini brains in a dish, if any of you saw that, and the fact that they were able to show that these cells had similar, however you would define that, um, uh, firing patterns to developing brains. But, but what they have been able to do is to create these models that we believe are more physiologically relevant that could be used to study development and disease. Now, this is not so easy to do, right? There's a lot of complexity in these models. It's very hard to consistently develop them. Most of our analyses and drug discovery are two-dimensional. Now we're trying to analyze things in three dimensions. So the, there's a lot of challenges, but we're already seeing some pretty amazing proof of principle leveraging these types of, of models. So for time's sake, I'm just going to touch on the one on the left because I think it's particularly impactful. But it's an example of a patient who had a very rare form of cystic fibrosis. And there were no uh, treatments on the market for his particular uh, form. And fortunately, his physician knew of some work being done in the, in the labs, the uh, Clevers and, and um, Bernick labs, of creating personalized organoids. And so what they did was they took the patient's cells, um, converted somatic cells into stem cells and created these personalized organoid assays just for him. And then they screened every known sort of cystic fibrosis treatment against those models, picked the one that showed the response in the dish, and then gave that treatment to the patient who had a remarkable recovery. I think this is going to really play a dramatic role in really enabling personalized medicine going forward. I think it'll be incredibly powerful. The, the second area, which I won't touch too much on because I think there's a fantastic gene therapy uh, session later this afternoon, is around gene editing. And it's been impressive to see the evolution in gene editing technologies. You know, many, many years ago, editing technologies were a little bit cumbersome. The efficiency was low. Scientists would screen thousands of cells to find the few that had been edited. But the evolution of these technologies, uh, talon nucleases, CRISPRs, has really gotten us to an amazing point where the efficiency of these tools is quite profound, not just for knocking out genes, but doing SNP repair and knock-ins. And for those of you who follow this more closely, even this week, there was an interesting paper by Lou et al. Uh, introducing this new way of editing, prime editing. And so I think you're going to continue to see so much innovation in this space so that we can really get that really high level of efficiency and hopefully really minimal off-target effects. And shown here are just two examples. And like I said, there'll, there'll be a great panel this afternoon where we'll probably hear a lot more examples. But the, the one on the left is, is some work done by Selectus, who has been using both CRISPRs and, and Talons uh, in CAR-T. I think probably everyone in the room is familiar with, with CAR-T treatment, and that it involves gene editing T cells to create these sort of superpower T cells that sort of go back into a patient's body and, and fight the cancer. 
you know, most of those treatments today are autologous in nature, or said another way, take the patient's own cells. And one of the reasons why we do that, even though it's fairly cumbersome, is because we're trying to minimize the immunogenicity of, of the therapy. And so on the right is just one example of how scientists and clinicians are trying to leverage gene editing tools to change cells to create universal donor type cells uh, that won't trigger that immune response. And last but certainly not least, I believe that artificial intelligence and whether you're talking about machine learning or something altogether different will have a profound impact on, on healthcare, not just how we treat patients, but certainly how we develop, discover uh, treatments, but also how we manufacture treatments. And you know, one of the things that I think is, is happening right now is we're starting to learn how much different patient-derived cells respond very differently in culture. So using one protocol to take someone's T cells and grow them up in a dish doesn't work very well. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. And so we might be entering an era where we need to use real-time data on how these cells are expanding and growing to feed back and change the protocol, change how we're taking care of those cells so that those specific cells optimally expand for the patient. And that's a whole different discussion you know, with regulatory agencies because you're starting to talk about sort of changing what you're doing midstream. But I, I do believe that these three areas of technology will play a key role together, along with other technologies that have been around longer, in really bringing this vision that I think many of us have for personalized medicine uh, to fruition. And, and so with that, I think I stayed within my time. I'll, I'll just wrap things up. Do you have any questions? Me? Oh, that is a great um, question. Uh, organoids, uh, by definition, start off with a, with a stem cell, and so far there's been many different types of organoids. Mini brains I reference. We've certainly seen it for gut. I don't know that we've proven that they could be used for everything. Um, I think there's potential there, but I, I think there's still more work to be done to see if you could, in fact, use an organoid model for everything. For your cystic fibrosis patient, was it a pulmonary organoid? That I do not know. That I do not know. Could go on. Okay. What else? Okay, okay. we'll um, continue with the next Yeah, one. last one. So. Um, going to be a little bit more hands-on here and try to uh, continue the talk from Dr. Toffel here. And, and basically, I'm, I'm an interventional cardiologist, uh, so I'm going to give you some examples on, on how we are using this in the clinic today and also how this might involve in the near future. So it's basically individualized patient simulation. And also, I will touch on some computational models that we can use when doing these rather complex uh, procedures. Just to uh, set the floor here, uh, you all are aware of that valve diseases are, are common in the Western world. Uh, the prevalence is also increasing by age and has been associated with a poor out outcome. And until recently, the only treatment options we have had has been open heart surgery. But uh, over the last 15 years, actually, transcatheter treatment has revolutionized the way we are treating valve disease in cardiology today. Uh, it has been shown to be uh, superior in the setting of uh, aortic stenosis and, and mitral re uh, regurgitation to medical therapy. And as you are aware, just recently, also TAVAR, treatment of uh, aortic stenosis percutaneously, has been proven to be superior even to surgery, even uh, uh, in patients at low risk uh, for surgery. So the challenges that we are facing as interventional cardiologists today uh, when undertaking these uh, procedures, especially for the mitral and tricuspid uh, uh, valves, is that this, these are very complex procedures. We are using different uh, uh, both imaging modalities and treatment modalities. And still, these interventions are quite few as well. So what we need to do in order to both improve our outcome, 
but also shorten the learning curve of these procedures. It's to have a, a patient specific, and that is important. So we don't have a generic uh, uh, training, but we have a patient specific pre procedural training and also planning before we actually do the procedure. So now comes the hands on. I'm going to show you how we use that actually in the clinic today uh, on a micro regurgitation case. So um, this is a patient with heart failure and uh, a secondary mitral regurgitation, as you are aware of. This is not a disease of the valve. This is a disease of the LV. And as we have a dilatation of the left ventricle, you have a traction of the subvalvular apparatus and a dilatation of the mitral annulus. This can now be treated uh, by different uh, uh, percutaneous modalities, but one of them is that you have a percutaneous um, uh, analoplasty. So this is fully percutaneous. This is transvenous transeptal, and it's actually uh, now a dacron mesh that is uh, screwed into the native mitral annulus by multiple screws, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, usually up to uh, 70 screws are actually put in, and this is done uh, through fluoroscopy and TOE, advanced TOE guidance, I must say. So when you have fixated this dacron mesh, you are now able, under TOE guidance, to change this mesh. And uh, uh, the result is then that you have a reduction in the mitral uh, analysis, and as a consequence also then a reduction in micro regurgitation. Once again, uh, this involves very advanced imaging. It involves me as an interventional cardiologist. It in involves uh, echo, CT, and so on. And in order to have a good result, we need to be trained, basically. So what we do before we actually do this procedure now is that we have an individualized patient simulator. So the actual patient that we are supposed to treat the next day enters uh, into the simulator. So that means the CT and the echo pictures go, goes into the simulator and we create a case. So then we actually perform the case in the simulator and then we can see where we have our problems. So we can stop and we can discuss what to do in order to overcome this problem. So after having done the simulated case, there is a review of us, uh, of me as an interventional cardiologist, but also of the imaging, where we can see how we actually perform during the different stages of this procedure. And then we can do the simulation again and try to improve. But I think what is even more uh, uh, important is actually that when we have done the case, so this is pictures from the actual case, so you see the fluoroscopy picture and the echo picture. Then after having done the case, once again, we can then also compare that with the simulation case. So then you can see, did we actually do what we intended to do? And if we did not, why did this happen? And can we in any way improve the next time we do a procedure like this? So this is the end of a case. You will see the chinching of the mitral annulus to the left here. And on the right-hand side, you see the remaining quite mild mitral regurgitation. So uh, sort of glimpsing a little bit to the future, this is still quite, um, uh, well, it's not that as advanced as Eric has showed you, but this is where we want to go, of course, and, and, and in, to create a virtual, a real virtual patient. And this is now intense uh, 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 research around this, not only in our group, where you import even more patient-specific data into a computational uh, model, a computational simulation. And then you don't only have the personalized data, but also from uh, the community. And, and when you have that together, you can actually have a virtual patient. And then you can not only study this patient at, at this stage, but also you can study disease progression. You can study what happens if we treat this patient this way with this uh, device, or do we need combined devices? Uh, so these are uh, the area where I think it's extremely exciting right now, and it's not only exciting for us in order to try 
to go from this uh, uh, one-size-fits-all medicine to a more personalized medicine. So this patient needs this and this treatment. We have tested that in a simulation model before, so that's what we're going to go for. But also for you guys that sit here, of course, this could also potentially shorten the time from bench top to, to, uh, to the clinical uh, uh, investigations that you want to do. Uh, uh, in order to test new devices and or new drugs, of course. Okay, thank you. Very cool. We have any questions? Video game. Or is that the one? Is that one? Yeah. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. Very nice presentation. Thank you. My question is: Is the clinical outcome? I don't know if you've done a side by side. Mm -hmm. um, significantly better when you do the simulation than yeah. the other because the cost and the time, the patient's time is must be great. Yeah. So what we see, this is uh, this is early data, but we could see that now. So uh, so actually, the time, the learning curve goes down considerably uh, when having the, this patient-specific simulation. So that is what we see when we work together with Edwards for this uh, particular project. Mm -hmm. So that is at least the, uh, the uh, early findings that we have. So then we also need to know, because that's also in interesting, does the learning curve go down, but is also the results, are the results better? That, that would be fantastic, of course, but that's, uh, that's, that needs to be proven. So a lot of this is promising. Mm -hmm. We have talked about that. I think that is important to stress. It is promising, but a lot of it needs to be proven as well. Yeah. So you have to do a retrospective study then? Yeah, re uh, right now, this is actually prospective. So yeah, we have retrospective data that looks promising, but what we are doing now is prospective. So there are centers using this personalized uh, 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 simulation and centers that are not. So, so right now, uh, for this particular uh, procedure, there is no center in the U.S. using it. It's not; uh, it's under investigational use in the U.S. right now. The Cardiband procedure. Yeah. Have any more questions from audience? Do we? Um, yes. What kind of other procedures do you think this could be applied to with similar? So um, when it comes to that, so I'm, I'm, I'm narrow-minded, of course. I only know my field. Uh, so so um, I would say, for example, a lot of you are probably familiar with the Tavar devices. I think the Tavar devices, is, it's, it's the Tavar procedure is a rather easy procedure to do. So I don't think necessarily that you need to tra be trained like this for that. But what would be interesting is to compare the effect of different Tavar devices for a specific patient. So basically the next level. Because it's, that's also, again, it's, it's, uh, it's not that... <laughs> right now, when you come to a center, very often they use only one Tavar device. But for sure, it's not the best for every patient. So, uh, the high volume centers know this. So that is where I think we, you could use this to actually test different devices for a specific patient and then you go for the for the device that you think has had the best performance for that specific patient once again going for a tailor-made uh, procedure and the other yes please can i also go back maybe dr tobo can also talk about um, the diagnostic errors and how this can help diagnostic errors yeah, the diagnostic errors are um, very much uh, the first target of AI in medicine because not only are they frequent, but they are also um, because clinicians are, are making such hasty decisions. Uh, if, a, if a doctor doesn't think of a diagnosis in the first five minutes, the uh, accuracy rate drops down from 90-some percent to 25%. So the idea is to provide differential diagnoses uh, from the data of the patient, but also, as already reviewed, the images uh, are a big part of medicine. No less all the data that is very difficult in the limited time each doctor has with a patient to assimilate all the data, the labs, the prior medical history, 
uh, the ongoing uh, uh, problems. And so the ability to tee that up, to integrate that, and to give not only a differential diagnosis, but also um, some um, pointed uh, areas to probe. Uh, these, these, are, these are important ways to make ac diagnosis more accuracy. One of the problems we don't uh, accept today is how bad things are. That is, this pervasive problem of medical errors, largely diagnostic, uh, is much more serious than has been pre previously acknowledged. Okay. Well, I wanna then the other question. Yes. Can I follow up on that? How do you think that will impact the economics of all these physicians who are trained to be reading mammography films and so on? I'm sure it's going to be impactful, right? Right. Well, well, Jeffrey Hinton, who's the father of deep learning, he said we don't, we don't need radiologists anymore. But I think that's completely wrong. Uh, the point is that. You don't want to entrust any serious matter to an algorithm if it's uh, you know, a, uh, something that would require an operation or cancer, whatever. It's serious. You'd like to have a human uh, context and uh, insight that's also uh, overseeing the image as an example. So uh, the way radiologists can go forward is, for one, uh, they, they can be more efficient and productive for sure because they spend a lot of time reviewing each image, often has many, many different subfiles. But in addition, most radiologists, interestingly, want to have patient contact instead of living in the basement, in the dark. Uh, and so this would enable that. They could actually be a gatekeeper for all the unnecessary scans, which is an epidemic in this country of unnecessary ionizing radiation exposure. In addition, they could be very much the arbiter because they're in the neutral zone so that instead of the, per the surgeon who wants to do the operation, or the cardiologist, or whoever, they could help uh, to give the objective interpretation directly to the patient. So there's many things that radiologists can do that they're not doing today, and that's where I expect uh, them to kick in. Yes, please. I have a... So uh, focusing on individualized and personalized medicine, and you, you touched on a hot button for me when we start looking at algorithms. And to me, there's a disconnect between personalized medicine and, and purely the algorithms. And we see it with some of the coronary flow reserve software that's used. And when we start looking at, at removing the radiologist or, or the cardiologist, for that matter, from, from a procedure like a triple vessel disease where you can easily miss it, in diagnostic imaging where you see an, an equal decrease in quantification. Um, how is it we can take some of the, the learnings in using something like the, um, the cardio band, take some of the human error out of it and make it a little bit more auto driving where it's a little more automated in actually the mechanics of installing it using the, the, the um, proper imaging techniques up front to map it first. Yeah. Um, versus just using some of the algorithms to generalize, I'll say, to, to a high extent and in removing the, the personal out of the personalized medicine. No, I, I definitely think, I mean, there is, there is uh, now entering in, in the field that I, I'm in uh, quite a bit of r robotic. I mean, there's been already robotic p PCI. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, this has not entered uh, the structural world yet because I think that these procedures are specifically good to, to uh, actually uh, have a robotic or automated uh, uh, procedure, for sure, especially these procedures, actually. So I definitely think that's possible uh, and, and will happen. This and also the microclip procedure that's available in the US, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Question for uh, Dr. Uh, Rosenberg. Doctor. I got a promotion, a new degree. <laughs> a microphone, please. I'm Stan Weiss, an epidemiologist at the New Jersey Medical School. I was glad to see you touch at least briefly upon the issue of quality, particularly quality in big data. I'm concerned as an epidemiologist about biases in study design, data collection, especially missing data. The assumption usually is that data is missing at random. We have many biostatistical techniques to impute the missing data and people go on. 
in my experience, data is almost never missing at random. It's highly biased uh, and often leads to mistakes and conclusions. I was wondering if you comment on where you're going in terms to have better annotation on data sets and trying to address this type of issue. That's a really good question. So um, we can't, well, what we, we, there's a few things that we can do. So when you set up a clinical trial in, in the new world, you set up the data you expect to collect in what manner you collected and what setting you collected and what frequency you collected. And that could be I get it from an EHR, I get it from a wristwatch, I put it into a form, I get it from a lab, and the software detects the missing data. If it's not there and it should be, it can alert you that the data is missing. But there it puts the burden on someone to set up the clinical trial in such a way where you know the data you want to collect which is different than discovery, where you grab a bunch of data and just try to analyze it and trust that, that enough data is there. Um, at some level, the data is the data, and so you have to be careful that if you're going to draw epidemiological conclusions or population conclusions, that you have to go back and make sure that the data supports that. But in the clinical trial setting, you know what data you want, and you can keep track of whether you got it or not, and then you can keep track of where it goes once you get it which is a high level of rigor than just collecting a bunch of healthcare data that was put there for billing purposes. So. Mm -hmm. Any more questions here? I have a general question for the panel, and that's how quickly can these uh, novel multidisciplinary approaches <coughs> succeed in transforming clinical research and accelerate the transition to precision medicine? Well, the, the, there I go first. The, well, the, yeah. the, the term precision medicine is used a lot, but we actually want more than that. We want accuracy in medicine, not just precision. Uh, and in, I think what you've heard uh, throughout are all the different tools that are just uh, expanding, whether it be organoids, and that's being used also in cancer to guide therapy, whether it's the individualized um, procedurals. Uh, all these things are going to help uh, some of the precision and accuracy, but the problem we have, again, is because today it isn't that way. Uh, most medications actually don't work because they're not matched up with the right person. Uh, and so we have a long ways to go, and these are just some of the strategies that exist that need to be built upon. Else? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just build on that. I guess the, the short answer is these technologies are already enabling precision medicine to a certain extent. But what we're not seeing is the magnitude of the impact in terms of the number of patients that were really feeling the positive effects. And I think what we'll see over the next decade is that the impact of these technologies um, will really start to have a material impact on human health, unlike right now, where we've picked out specific examples of where we're starting to see proof of concept. And there's, I don't know, maybe at best been hundreds of patients that have had a positive impact of these technologies versus the hundreds of thousands that we hope uh, will feel the impact of these technologies in the future. I'm fine with that answer. <laughs> Anybody else? How does um, artificial intelligence uh, influence the um, uh, doctor-patient relationship? Yeah. I think that's, that's, the, that's the dream of the future, which is, firstly, uh, which is happening now in certain venues, is liberation from keyboards. Mm -hmm. They are the common enemy of patients and doctors. And they can be eliminated through voice uh, AI. And so we're already seeing in many clinics around the world, not so much in the US, that there's uh, synthetic notes. In the US, we are increasingly relying on human scribes. So here in 2019, we're going pre-Gutenberg. <laughs> uh, we're expected to have 100,000 human scribes uh, by the end of this year in this country, which is preposterous. But that can be done through AI. And after images, the next best thing AI can do is take voice. So um, the fact that notes are far better than the ones that are in electronic records today, that's just the beginning of cracking the case of what's wrong in the doctor-patient relationship. The idea is the gift of time, that is the unloading of these uh, tasks 
like the data clerk function, and also the uh, given more autonomy to patients. This gives that time to decompress for, for system two thinking and to get the presence, the trust, uh, the bond, the empathy, all these qualities that are the essential part of the patient-doctor relationship. That's the, that's the dream of the future if we do it right. Unfortunately, we have one problem. Administrators, which outnumber <coughs> clinicians by 10 to 1, <coughs> they don't have anything to do with patient care, they are into productivity and efficiency. So if we let them rule the roost, they will actually squeeze doctors and nurses more. So we have to revolt and not allow that to happen. Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> With that, I think we'll close the session. That's a good way to finish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.